Thank you. Uh, it's good to see you here, Klaas. And I'm very uh, pleased to uh, introduce Klaas de Fraser. He is a uh, professor of political communication at the University of Amsterdam, and also at the same place, a research professor, a distinguished faculty research professor of artificial intelligence, data, and democracy. He is also related to our university as he is an affiliated professor at um, the Department of Political Science and Journalism at the University of Southern Denmark. Now, as you may infer from this uh, brief, brief sketch of uh, Clay's merits, uh, his research is both important and influential. Um, evidence in support of this claim can be easily inferred by a visit to Google Scholar, where he has uh, more than 28,000 citations and an age index of 89. All of this to say, Claes is a leading scholar in the field of political science, AI, democracy, and journalism. And more to the point, he's also a great colleague. Thanks for being here, Claes, and uh, take it away. Thank you. Torbjörn, thank you so very much for those kind words. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me to be able to give this uh, this talk today uh, at Diaz. I was uh, delighted to be able to join uh, Diaz as an external chair earlier this year, and I look forward to more interactions and hopefully also soon seeing each other uh, in the in the Diaz building, which I'm yet yet to see. Um, I have indeed been affiliated also with the University of Southern Denmark for for more than a decade now, uh, and it's always been really nice to see the the new development that are happening uh, at the university. Um, they have very much resonated with some of the developments in my own work and in my profile, having studied uh, the role of political campaigns and uh, technology elections, the news media coverage of politics and its influence on public opinion and electoral behavior over the past couple of decades. Uh, it's clear that in the last years, the role of technology, the impact of digitalization, the out role of uh, artificial intelligence also in the realm of politics and democracy has rather big ramifications. Um, and as such, I think if you look at democracy today, we see that uh, there are quite a few challenges and these are real challenges. They come from what you could call uh, streams within our own democracies that advocate rather illiberal democratic practices and processes. They also come from an erosion and a challenge to some of the trust that core democratic institutions have uh, traditionally been enjoying. Uh, they also come with big societal changes around climate crisis, inequalities, identity politics, but they also come from changes in what you might label uh, the information ecology and ecosystem, where we have seen new intermediaries, new uh, actors on the floor, and that has led to what you could also say a, a, an information pollution um, and where journalistic and news business models have become under pressure. And if you then add to this mix of already big and existing challenges, uh, new and rapid te technological developments and AI developments that are founded in computer science and data science and have to do with very granular and targeted abilities of matching information with individuals and groups. Well, then we have a situation where I somewhat polemically ask if we have a democracy on, on steroids uh, and to remind ourselves steroids are of course things that uh, could hopefully pump up muscles and bones uh, of a body. And in this case, it might be the democratic institutions, but they can also challenge and undermine uh, very healthy systems. And I think we have to ask ourselves what they're doing to our, our democratic system, whether they are pumping up and, and, and making stronger existing institutions or whether they are challenging, undermining, aggravating, and or maybe even causing some, some side effects that were not anticipated. So what I want to do today's talk is to introduce this line of thinking uh, in our ongoing research uh, on, on what it is that AI does in terms of 
uh, challenges to democratic processes. Uh, look at that across a different no, a number of different key actors in a democratic process, and then bring in some relatively new data on also how citizens see and perceive some of these challenges. I take a bit of a more emphasis today on what AI means in terms of challenges for uh, news media, both as institutions, but also as, as, as journalism as such, as this is such a core part of the democratic process. I won't uh, spend a lot of time uh, defining democracy at this point of the, of the presentation, but uh, obviously some of these observations will have different meetings as to whether we are discussing more, say, procedural, com uh, competitive or, or more participatory versions of democracy. But maybe just a few words uh, on, the, on another core concept, namely uh, the notion of AI, and here I take a rather uh, sort of uh, working approach to it and saying so the EU has itself defined it as a collection of technologies that combine data algorithms and computing power and one of the key hallmarks uh, of AI is of course the ability of these systems to self-learn uh, from, from this data in order to achieve specific goals. Uh, I think it's fair to say that in a lot of things in the social world uh, we're not so much looking at 100% of artificial intelligence but very often look at some kind of hybrid intelligence in which uh, we have systems and data interacting uh, and have architects uh, that have built some of these systems that then might later on have a self-learning component to it, but few of them are really, uh, what do you say, 100% artificial in nature, but more about augmenting human intellect and capacities and oftentimes uh, rather um, complementing them and not per se replacing them. Um, it's also important to note that uh, the EU uh, regulation uh, proposals around AI are, of course, have just been, been published, and I'll, I'll return to that in a second. But let us first take a step back. Uh, one of the things that we can ask ourselves when we look at, at democracy and the key actors in, uh, involved in democratic processes is, well, what might actually be different with the, with the arrival of artificial in, intelligence? And I'll say a bit about how it has changed uh, politics and, and political actors themselves, uh, how it is challenging uh, different institutions uh, as part of our public administration system, focus a bit more on news and so social media, and also uh, how it is challenging our role as citizens in, in these processes. So starting first with uh, politics and here turning to classic political actors such as political parties. Uh, on the one hand, you could say that in uh, campaigns, there has always been an interest in uh, and a attempt to try and collect as much data by campaigns in order to match it up later uh, with other types of data to identify potential um, citizens or potential voters or groups of voters that would be of particular interest to a political party. That is not new. What is new is that the uh, magnitude to which this is happening and the automated process through, the, through which this is happening. Um, so again, having uh, a, a staff um, in a political campaign that has been trying to uh, target canvassing or the visiting of markets to particular places that were of, of the most promising interest, that is not new, but mining data online, getting this information from voters uh, online behavior, and then trying to match up and also trying to match up using automated systems uh, with messages that might resonate particularly well with some of these voters, that is what is new. Uh, you can say that there's a bit of a sort of war ongoing online where political micro-targeting is really taking off and where uh, technologies around automated accounts that also um, uh, add content to the political campaigns, as well as automated accounts that try to counter and find and identify these automated accounts is a bit of a sort of online political uh, campaign warfare. More recent developments, of course, uh, 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 gravitate towards the importance of visuals also in this space and the AI technology that is enabling uh, the development of something like deep fakes. Uh, and, and that has already been seen to uh, influence or and affect certain parts of, of campaigns. And this is probably a development that, that we are bound to see more of in, in the future. Um, one of the key questions that, that this development in the political realm is posing is also a challenge for uh, news media as say the fourth estate uh, and the ones that are usually the ones 
probing, questioning, and following political campaign, namely journalists, are hereby challenged uh, whether or not they have the capacity to follow and to cover and also uncover some of these uh, online practices that involve both uh, data mining, data matching, uh, involve new actors such as data brokers and the services that they provide, but also um, involve AI technologies such as the development uh, of, uh, uh, of campaign messages to specific targeted audiences, as well as something like deepfakes. So that's a couple of examples from the political realm. If we turn to more what we could say sort of public administration and, and, and core institutions in that area. So, uh, the, the examples are also abundant, but also good, I think, to get a, a, a notion of, of the breadth of the, uh, of the impact that this is having. We can think about this in relation to uh, ministries where um, uh, ministries of education have been rolling out and using AI also in profiling uh, and identifying both vulnerable uh, people in the educational sector, but also to replace, for example, grading, uh, uh, which happened last year uh, as part of the uh, pandemic grading system in, in the UK, um, and, and which led also to an uproar due to some rather um, banal um, uh, challenges with the way that this system was set up that, and, and taking great in, influence from things like postal and zip code in order to determine uh, gradings uh, in, in the UK system. We have seen that uh, various ministries of uh, health have been rather challenged over the past months in rollout, not only in general uh, health uh, measures, but in particular in response to COVID-19, uh, where discussions about technology use, uh, the use of drone technologies to look at crowds, the use of apps and surveillance uh, uh, mechanisms in, in order to track both the, the spread of COVID-19 or the interactions between citizens. Uh, we've seen multiple cases of what the, uh, the impacts can be of the rollout of digital technologies and AI in, in um, our local, at our local level, whether that is uh, in relation to smart cities, uh, think about uh, crowd management in, in larger cities, uh, but also the, the impact that, that new platforms and technologies have, uh, have played in creating new features of our cities, whether that, that be things like Airbnb and how that is not only creating new traffic and new patterns uh, to a city, but also a new digital representation of what a city is. We have seen uh, cases in the area of uh, tax authorities in multiple countries, SCAT in Denmark, one example, but uh, obviously in, in more countries uh, that uh, AI and, and profiling technology has been rolled out with what I think we can agree would be sort of varying degrees of success uh, in, in terms of the, the granularity and, and some of the ethical questions about profiling that have been raised. Um, we've also seen the rollout in, in, in the judiciary um, in some ways, we are already uh, comfortable or getting used to some parts of our uh, system being automated in nature. Uh, we already have cameras on roads that will determine how fast you drive. Uh, the initial uh, determining of fining in that area is also done automated. But there are big questions as to whether or not parts of sentencing and, and work in the judiciary could also be automated and what that would uh, uh, entail in terms of uh, of having a fairer or a less fair system of sentencing. And again here, uh, it also raises some really profound questions for the role of journalism, uh, because in a relation to all of these examples, we would typically uh, conceive of the role of journalists and news organizations as being agents that can probe a system, that can call into question uh, whether or not outcomes are fair, that can speak up for the, for the man of the, or the woman who might get in, in, in trouble in the system. And all of this is, is being challenged by outcomes that are uh, automated uh, and, and uh, not generated necessarily with a human in the loop. Focusing indeed a little bit more on what do some of these challenges then mean for for news media, uh, for journalism, and for social media. Uh, and that will have an impact on at least a few areas. So on the one hand, you can see that new technologies and AI in particular are affecting the production mechanisms. 
um, the idea of robot journalism, automated and algorithmically driven journalistic content has already been applied in many news organizations around the world. It's also fair to say that most of the automated content that we see so far is mainly around sport results and uh, reporting on the stock market, but the technology and the ability to, do, to, uh, to create this type of content is, is there. Um, in addition to changes in the production, we can also look at changes in the distribution of news um, where the uh, interaction that the news media industry has with um, social media platform has been a particularly important one uh, and where there are both some potential benefits for news organizations in terms of spreading and, 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 and getting traffic to their journalistic content via social media platform, but obviously also a lot of challenges in terms of loss of control and also some uh, rather challenging issues around the, the funding of, of journalistic content on social media platforms. In addition, news organizations themselves have also applied um, or are applying more and more digital technologies and, and, and also AI in terms of optimizing their news recommender system and making a combination on the one hand, both of the digital traces that audiences and, and users of their platforms leave behind when engaging with their products, whether on apps or on websites, but on the other hand, of course, also leveraging some of the indications that people give as to what they prefer in terms of contents and what kind of interest they might have. Uh, and all of this collectively is posing a number of challenges for the uh, news media and, and in terms of its business model, uh, in terms of work roles and routines within the newsrooms and the distribution, you could say, of, of power in the newsroom, where uh, new professions have also entered uh, data sciences and the ones that are uh, the supporters and the managers of uh, content management system and news recommender algorithms have had a greater voice come to the newsroom than what we have seen in the past. And especially this news recommender system, which is of course one type of recommender systems more broadly is also one that where there's a lot of research ongoing right now, trying to unravel what are some of the design features and some of the functionalities of these recommender systems and what does that mean for uh, the diversity of a news diet? What does it mean for the experience that a user has with news and the downward effects that that might have for uh, trust in and engagement with news as a, as a, as a product and as a commodity uh, and as a genre? Uh, uh, what are the effects in terms of learning from the news? Does it enable more deep learning on a smaller variety of topics, for example, or does it erode rather uh, broader learning uh, that you would have in a system where there would be less recommendation system affecting your news diet. It has raised, raised questions as to what these systems do for the creation of or the amplification of uh, bubbles uh, and its uh, uh, downstream consequences for whether or not that is also contributing to processes of polarization or depolarization as well as political engagement and participation. These topics are really uh, hot topics in the area that I work in, in the sort of intersection between uh, communication science, political science uh, and, and, and data science. And there's a lot of uh, discussion right now, well, how could we maybe build into some of these um, uh, recommender systems, um, public values that we would consider good vis-a-vis -vis democratic processes, whether they have to do with diversity or fairness, uh, or making sure that there's a better optimization between personal interest uh, and, and, and what is being provided also in the, in the area of, of recommendation systems. It's also uh, important to uh, sometimes take a step back and say that not all of these developments are linear developments and, uh, and, and, and a sort of a uh, unchangeable rollout of new technology. And we see that right now uh, around the role of uh, route of, of, of conversational agents uh, such as Alexa uh, in terms of also providing news uh, and how the recent months of having been at the home, uh, a lot has also uh, led to some uh, first results saying that, that it might not be for all 
uh, functionalities such as news provision that these conversational agents, at least initially, uh, would be a big, a big feature of our news diet. But that is not to say that this will not, uh, not, not, not change uh, over time. But the the first sort of initial evidence in this area here illustrated with the Alexa just shut up uh, that we've had uh, maybe uh, enough of interactions with with uh, with home devices over the past months and also already uh, uh, from a year and a half ago uh, that this whole notion of chatting with the news and asking a conversational agent what is the news right now what topic should i be concerned about right now uh, is, is maybe not a type of product that that is being that is ready to be rolled out more broadly taking uh, a next step and moving on to uh, uh, how does ai affect not only say political actors such as political campaigns uh, different actors in, in our public administration system uh, and the news media in particular, but also turning for, for a while to looking at, at ourselves, looking at citizens. Um, there, of course, the rollout of uh, digital technologies and, and AI are part of a much larger uh, and historically rooted discussion about uh, the rollout of new technology in general. Um, I think without simplifying uh, uh, existing work too much, uh, there has with every rollout of new technology been a sort of a, a tech optimism and a tech pessimism perspective on new technologies uh, that dates all for sure back if you look at also the, the history of, of the rollout of the mass media as to what might radio, what might print what might broadcasting do to us as, as citizens. And, and equally much, these questions have also, of course, been asked vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, artificial intelligence, also with an eye to whether or not there are features of this uh, uh, technology that would be fundamentally different and, and would accelerate uh, some, some developments that are already there. Um, this has also been tied into discussions as to whether or not uh, AI and the rollout of computers and robotics would do uh, significant things to the workplace and replace parts of the workforce. But we see this uh, continuation of a technology discussion where we can at least identify the, the techno optimism and the techno uh, pessimism. And in some of the work that we have conducted, we thought that it would be useful to say, well, let's try and probe a little bit more and get a better sense of uh, citizens' perceptions when it comes to, uh, to AI. And so here's a result from a um, survey that we conducted in the Netherlands, um, where we asked um, uh, citizens uh, uh, to, to mention to us the first sort of sectors that they had in mind when they thought about automated decision making being done by artificial intelligence. And I think the first result that is really worth mentioning is that in a general survey based question that about half of the respondents really ha had no answer to a question like that. And that's an important, uh, that's an important first result to suggest that, uh, that many people may not have currently a very full-blown image of what AI could do in, in different sectors. And then if we dive more into the 50% that, that, that did provide an answer in this area, we see that different uh, sectors uh, um, are sort of at the top of the imagination as to where would AI maybe, maybe play a role here uh, when it comes to automated decision-making. One is in response to the, uh, the health sector, think about things such as decisions about who will get and who will not get a health insurance or the use of AI for the diagnosis of diseases or suggesting treatments. Um, the second sector that was mentioned had to do with, with justice. Again, there think about things that can be automated in the justice systems, um, sentencing uh, for standard uh, um, things or early parole or early release uh, reviews uh, can be standardized. Um, Commerce, uh, everything that has to do with automated assistance, uh, whether it is about credit ratings or uh, offers for mortgages or loans, um, or in terms of uh, a customer or product recommendations. Um, a fourth sector is the sector that I'm looking at more particularly is the, the realm of sort of media and politics. What are some of the automated decisions that, 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 can, that can be of importance here when it comes to electoral processes and electoral integrity, uh, news recommendations, uh, why do certain people see certain types of political advertisements and others uh, are not? 
so the idea of micro-targeting, uh, and yet other examples uh, came more from the self-driving car that has been, I think, also a, a top example internationally. Uh, the, the automated control of roads would also be an, a, a topic from that area. Uh, and finally, uh, issues that relate to work, more generally speaking, the replacement of work, the, uh, uh, the robotification of, of work, but also a planning of work schedules. And if we had done this survey more recently, I'm sure that issues of uh, surveillance and uh, working at home monitoring systems for efficiency and interaction would also have been some of the topics that, that would have come up. Um, but that's a, a first glimpse of what are some of the sectors that come to mind uh, when, when people think about what kind of automated decisions might be possible by AI, with the caveat of saying that about 50% uh, had a very hard time articulating one of these examples. Moving forward, we also asked through in this uh, survey in the Netherlands about who might be more um, afraid of, of AI. And, and, and they did that by having them read first a definition of, of um, automated decision-making by saying what it might be able to do, and then answer a bunch of questions about the uh, perceptions of, of AI. So if automated decision uh, uh, taking it can be defined as computers and system taking uh, um, decisions that were previously taken by, by, uh, by humans, then whether or not these new decisions that are now take, taken automatically, whether or not they would be seen as, for example, more useful or more fair uh, or more risky in nature. And, and, and I'll show a couple of uh, slides illustrating uh, some of the of the results here. So, in terms of usefulness, uh, you see here a, a breakdown on, on on a scale of, of one to seven as to whether or not uh, AI would be perceived in general as useful. Uh, and you know, we have about forty percent of the respondents being a bit above the midpoint of the scale here. But we also looked at what might predict some of these things, and we see that those with uh, higher degrees of education, more knowledge about the topical area, uh, those who score higher uh, um, in, on, for example, self-efficacy, that they tend to be more uh, positive around, about this usefulness of AI, whereas those who are uh, um, uh, of higher age, uh, females, and those who are expressing stronger degrees of privacy concern tend to be less optimistic about the usefulness of AI. Uh, we ask the same type of question with, with fairness, and you see also distribution where uh, the respondents are somewhat uh, more split here, uh, with about one third above the midpoint and one third about, uh, below the midpoint. Uh, and we see here that again, that, that knowledge and self-efficacy, uh, uh, that those are things that contribute to seeing AI as fair, um, whereas those who score higher on, on privacy concerns would also tend to be less inclined to believe uh, that, that AI uh, can contribute to fairness in automated decision making. Uh, perhaps also interesting was looking at risk perceptions. We see here that a majority of respondents were more negative, that is that they are scoring above the, the midpoint on the, uh, on the panel to the right uh, for evaluating the potential in terms of risk with only about 20% or so uh, being rather optimistic uh, about, uh, about this. Here we see that again, uh, uh, privacy concerns, uh, uh, age, and, and gender are contributing towards these, these risk perceptions. These were some initial results that for us said, okay, this is interesting to probe this space between what citizens and what we as uh, consumers and citizens feel comfortable with when it comes to what you could pitch as human versus machine types of, of decisions. And we pursued that in another study where we said, well, we can think of many types of decisions that can be either automated or not automated. Uh, and we pursued that here in terms of uh, the media sector, the health sector and the justice sector. So on the left hand side, you'll see these, these three sectors. And then we tried to develop some scenarios uh, where there would either be uh, rather a low impact or a high impact of that decision that could be taken either by uh, an AI or by a human. So um, to dive into the uh, media examples, uh, we said, well, a low uh, impact decision might be whether or not it is an AI system or whether it is a human editor, as we uh, know news from the past, uh, that would be deciding about whether or not there would be a recommendation of a uh, of a, of a piece of news at once you had finished reading an article, right? That decision that can be put to you and to be given to you either by an automated system driven on an on AI technology, or it could be posed to you by a human editor. 
that we might say that's a relatively low impact uh, a type of scenario where you would get a recommendation. A rather high impact uh, outcome would be whether or not it is a system uh, or a human editor that would decide to whether or not you would have uh, access to uh, Facebook or to your new site. And I want to say that we uh, ran these scenarios uh, before the discussion about, for example, Donald Trump's uh, uh, access to Facebook uh, and to Twitter and social media platform. But we did take this as, as an example as what is a relatively high impact example uh, of whether or not a, a system, basically AI or, uh, or a human in the loop would decide uh, whether or not a person would get blocked access to Facebook or a news site. And we came up with similar types of, of, of decision situations in the area of health getting fitness recommendations or whether or not that you would um, uh, get access to a uh, medical treatment uh, in the justice sector, whether or not uh, you would be given a parking ticket where you could argue that say, well, with the, with, the, with the size of Danish parking tickets, actually it's a high impact decision, but you could argue that it's a low impact uh, decision in, in some ways, at least compared to the high impact example uh, where a uh, decision would have to be made whether or not a um, a criminal law should, should be started or not. And with these scenarios in these different sectors, with, these, uh, with the distinction between high and low impact, we were trying to dive into where people would feel comfortable and when they would see AI as being useful and fair and risky in these different, uh, in different scenarios. And, and, and let me be uh, you know, straight up front and said that we went into this expecting to find a, a, a degree of sort of perceived human superiority that there might be in most of these decisions at the end of the day for a majority of people, the preference for a human in the loop, for a human taking the decision uh, on some of these issues. Um, but let's turn to some of the results here. So here are first the results on, on usefulness. Um, who would we rather see taking these different decisions? And there you again on the top, you now have the three different sectors. Then you have the low and the high impact um, uh, uh, scenarios. And then we also added a, an additional question whether or not that this would be an outcome that would impact yourself or whether it would impact others. We know of course from previous uh, literature that, that we think very differently about decisions for others than we do about ourselves. And, and in lower impact cases, we see no difference really between, uh, uh, between the usefulness perception uh, of AI or human taking the decisions. But for the high impact uh, scenarios, the usefulness of AI was seen as higher uh, in most of the cases, both for yourself and for others, than it was uh, if, a, if a human would be taking the decision. Uh, for fairness, again, in the low impact uh, examples, so these are the examples that are about recommendations in terms of health or news or getting a, a, a parking ticket, no difference between humans and AI in terms of being seen as who is more fair, but the high impact uh, conditions, uh, access to Facebook, uh, um, medical treatments, lawsuits, um, AI was preferred as the more fair uh, of the two rather than a human uh, in the cases of justice and, and, and health scenarios. And finally, when it comes to the risk perceptions, again, for the low impact scenarios or the smaller decisions, no real difference being perceived as uh, being the more risky of the two. But when it came to the high impact uh, decisions, uh, humans were seen in most of the cases as being the more risky decision taker. In other words, there was a preference uh, for having uh, an automated system make decisions about uh, blocking your own access to Facebook, about taking decisions uh, uh, about lawsuits starting or providing access to a treatment. And, and we we were somewhat surprised about the, the preference here um, uh, for AI and automated decision making uh, in these scenarios. And again, we ran this way before uh, the uh, decision of Facebook, for example, earlier this year in response to the riots at the Capitol to block access to a uh, for for Donald Trump to uh, the um, to the platform a uh, decision that has been most contested and, and only a few days ago uh, was in part upheld by the Facebook over, uh, oversight board, though the devil there is in the detail that they were agreeing to blocking access at that point in time, but said that Facebook did not have enough 
provisions and regulations that uh, that would allow for a sort of a fair decision that this should be uh, an indefinite decision. But the the point is that um, that uh, in the scenarios that we had created, uh, there was a preference amongst the respondents who took this survey to actually say, well, this decision should rather be a decision that is taken on the basis of, uh, say, AI that would determine that this kind of language use or this kind of, of actions online uh, uh, would be deemed a violation of the uh, usage of, of, of Facebook uh, terms of services or the community rules, which was the um, argumentation used by Facebook. So in summary, Returning back to sort of where, where the citizen perspective here and trying to compare these human versus AI decision makers uh, for specific scenarios across three important sectors in society, media, health and justice. Uh, uh, the overall uh, conclusion there is that, that the decisions that are driven by automated decision making are being perceived as on par. So equally useful, equally fair, uh, uh, equally risky if not in some cases better than the decisions that would be taken by, by human uh, experts. And we believe that this is important because it, it places a lot of responsibility at various levels, right? Um, if we uh, look again across the, the result that we see that both I think in society, but also uh, in some of the scholarly work on this uh, area around algorithmic decision makings, um, that there is a bit more optimism about, uh, amongst uh, those who are higher educated and score lo lower on privacy concerns, but that there is uh, a relatively high degree of, of, of trust uh, in automated decision making systems uh, at the outset uh, here. Um, which is comparable to the, the trust or as low as the trust uh, as, as you have in, in human experts taking decisions. Um, we can have a discussion later on whether that is an expression indeed of uh, the trust in automated decisions and AI being equally high and equally good as human decision making or equally bad because that of course ties into a whole discussion about uh, the ongoing crisis of trust in, in, in many uh, public decisions uh, currently versus uh, the narrative of the, the, the good and the better machine heuristic that you often see that is tied into uh, to the rollout of new technologies. We've had a look here at some data from the Netherlands. I don't have much reason to believe that, that, it, it, that the findings were hugely specific to the Netherlands, but we did, ran, uh, we did run a, a 10 country study where we zoomed a little bit more further into the, uh, the, the topic of the, of the new sector again um, and, and tried to look at whether or not uh, uh, human versus AI decisions in terms of uh, news recommenders were seen as, as, as better or worse. And here you, you sort of see a, uh, a graph looking across diff 10 different countries. Uh, the Netherlands is the country to the far left. Denmark is incidentally listed as the second country. And the higher the bars here, you would have a stronger uh, uh, um, um, perception of, um, uh, of, of, of AI as being uh, good in terms of, of providing uh, news recommendations uh, for is the midpoint. So you see that there's not a whole lot of, of cross-national va variation here, but that there's almost a belief that, that uh, AIs can take equally good decisions when it comes to, to news recommendations as, as, as humans can. Um, we ask the same kind of question in terms of, uh, of news creation. Is there a, uh, a faith in, in, in news being created by automated system being as good as it would be when it's created by journalists and editors. Here you see less of a um, perception of, of, of AI being good. Again, the midpoint would be four, but, but most of the scores are around the three point, which is a, a sort of somewhat less trust in, in AI here being a good news creator. And I think that's, that's potentially good news for those out there creating uh, good and more in-depth quality journalism at this point in time. Uh, but we do see, for example, higher scores uh, when it comes to content moderation as to whether or not that is something that should be done by, by humans and with a human in the loop, or uh, whether it's, it, it could be uh, done by, by automated systems. So in sum, when we look at these, uh, I think we find the, the news industry and uh, journalism at a, at, a, at a point where you say the big sort of takeaway here is that the, that the trust in, 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 in automated systems and in AI and the trust in humans making decisions in this space is actually rather similar. 
uh, and that's a very important uh, conclusion for the news industry because that means that they, these are the starting points that they have to deal with as, as they develop uh, their uh, their products in, in, in this area. It also points to a hugely important observation that is that we empirically know very little about some of these processes, whether it comes to uh, the uh, implementation of news recommender systems in the news industry itself, or it comes to news consumption on some of the uh, big social media platforms, whether we are talking Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, uh, or by now TikTok here, uh, and that we are as empirical scholars really challenged uh, with, uh, with, with issues about whether or not we can get a glimpse into these processes, whether or not we can also have uh, some of the outcomes, some of the recommendations being made as explainable. This ties into a big uh, discussion, of course, right now in computer science about the need for and the limits of explainable uh, AI. Uh, and as social science scholars with a great interest in collaborating with data scientists and computer scientists, I think we have come up with some different ways of either trying to work with the platforms or around the platforms in trying to get a better handle uh, uh, on this topic. And this is maybe something if there's interest in, in that particular, how to uh, uh, address some of this empirically, we can go into in, in the Q&A in, in a second. Um, in the last couple of minutes, I want to return then to the, to the main question of today, which is answering the question, is this democracy on, uh, on, on, on steroids? Uh, so I think on the one hand, uh, we see democratic systems that are already challenged by many developments in society and our economies as it is, and where new technologies, AI, amplify and augment some of these challenges. We see a, situ a situation where new players and new powers uh, are, are on the scene. Uh, and that's where we would hope that a new drug would be uh, strengthening the bones and the muscles of democracy. And in this case, maybe the democratic institutions and its operations, we may have at least tentatively to conclude that we are more seeing a bit of an erosion of some of these uh, um, institutions. It's an erosion that is a bit schizophrenic in the sense that on the one hand, there is a high degree of trust among citizens in decisions being taken by automated systems. But on the other hand, these institutions are really challenged in the rollout and the application of these new uh, technologies uh, and, and, and where the side effects, so to speak, are, are also rather, uh, uh, rather significant. Uh, and just as when we look at, 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 at as a drug like, like steroids would be, it's also very hard to follow the actual working on, of these drugs on the inside of the machinery uh, of, of our democratic processes. For the news media, oh, and, and this, uh, I should add, this discussion of, um, of what the rollout of these technologies mean in uh, terms of democratic processes is one where there's of course also been a big discussion of the need for regulation in this space uh, and where we have just seen a couple of weeks ago the first draft of the European Commission's attempt to uh, offer suggestions about AI regulation uh, and that the takes from both uh, nation states and, and those engaged in this in this space in uh, the academy and, and, and in the tech sector uh, are are very different so far uh, with a lot of ambitions in there and actually ambitions for identifying blacklisted and no-go areas in terms of the rollout of certain uh, parts, types of AI, uh, but also the relatively vague handles as to how that would look. For the news media, in conclusion, uh, they are really challenged as a democratic institution, as an organization by itself and as individual journalists because they have a couple of things that they need to turn to. First of all, they have a new challenge in terms of reporting and providing journalism about uh, the rollout of artificial intelligence across society. They have a challenge in terms of probing and investigating AI decisions. Uh, again, returning to the examples of tax authorities or municipality decisions, these were typically uh, decisions that a journalist sometimes on behalf of citizens, sometimes on their own initiative, could challenge, make transparent and probe why a certain decision had been taken. And that is of course, increasingly difficult with automated decisions. Uh, journalism is challenged by their own use of AI, 
are they transparent uh, in terms of the tools that they themselves, uh, either as content creation and production uh, or as distributors and news recommender systems are using. Uh, journalists are challenged as to whether or not they are thinking about embedding the role of AI and algorithm in existing journalistic codes. Uh, and probably one of the biggest challenges for uh, journalism and for news organization is to uh, take a position in this discussion going forward as to what it is, which kind of public values uh, that the uh, journalist organizations and the news organizations want to have at the center of the rollout of these new technologies. Um, I think with this, we've come up to the, uh, to the full hour. So I will stop the, the sharing here and, and open up for, uh, for questions and reflections uh, on, on this topic. Uh, I want to thank you very much for the attention and the opportunity to uh, do this DS lecture.